Welcome back to the Emerging Civil War Virtual Symposium. I'm Chris Mikowski, Editor-in-Chief. Thanks so much for joining us. It's my pleasure now to introduce my good friend, Stuart Henderson, whom I have known, it seems like, forever and ever. Uh, we started out as volunteers with the National Park Service 16 years ago. And uh, since that time, Stuart has joined the staff at Fredericksburg in Spotsylvania National Military Park as a historian. You can find him in summers uh, giving guided tours on all of the area's four battlefields. But his real passion is telling the story of the United States Colored Troops. Uh, he's really made this a passion project, has helped co-found a group of reenactors that uh, tell the story of the 23rd United States Colored Troops, the unit that first encountered Robert E. Lee's army here in the uh, Eastern Theater in the summer of 1864. And he's also done some work uh, with uh, some Massachusetts guys that folks maybe have heard of who've done a little work in the movie Glory. Um, who are those folks, right? Uh, Stuart is, is tireless in telling the story of the United States Colored Troops, men who found the inspiration to fight for their own freedom and in very literal sense gave a new birth of freedom and new meaning to the Civil War. So it's my delight and pleasure to introduce my friend Stuart Henderson. Thank you, Chris. Good morning. Chris makes everything seem like it was such a long time, but uh, I will tell you, if you saw a picture of me then, I looked 30 years younger. <laughs> but I'm a living historian with the 23rd Regiment United States Colored Troops, as well as Company B of the 54th Massachusetts Volunteers out of Washington, D.C. And Washington is my hometown, so have to be loyal to those guys. In this slide, you're going to see the combined group, it's just a small portion of both the 54th and the 23rd. Uh, the 23rd started in 2011, but those guys in the 54th have been there since 1988. And some of the guys that I work with there were in the movie Glory. Now, this picture was taken at the grand opening in 2012 of the Museum of the Confederacy in Appomattox which is now the American Civil War Center of Appomattox. And this was, uh, we were the honor guard for General U.S. Grant. Now, we were just supposed to bring him in and introduce him. And uh, next thing you know, he asked for us to stay for the surrender ceremonies at the end of the day. But the, tw the 54th mentors the 23rd. Now, many Americans were not aware of the service of the U.S. Colored Troops. And I guess it was until 1989 when the movie Glory came out. And it was a story of the 54th. And then in 1990, Ken Burns came out with his series. And that released more information of the United States Colored Troops. But they were part of a prominent discussion in the years during the Civil War and immediately after but when the Union and, Union and Confederate white soldiers started to reconcile, they just forgot about the United States Colored Troops. So over the past 10 years, I have been speaking about the U.S. Colored Troops, trying to bring that story to the many audiences that I've talked with. But just two years ago, they had the 30th anniversary of the Academy Award winning movie, Glory. It was shown in theaters all across the country. I, in solidarity with my members of the 54th Massachusetts, I went to the afternoon showing. I was in Fredericksburg, but they were in Washington, D.C. And I was surprised. I thought the theater was going to be sold out. But there were only about 25 people there. And five of them included me, because my wife and three of her members of the women of the Civil War era were there. After the movie was over, I had two white guys come up to me because I had my kepi on and my 54th Massachusetts t-shirt. And we spent about five minutes talking about the 54th. So I'm not surprised about the lack of awareness. It just means that me and my fellow living historians, no matter how elderly we get, we still have to get out 
and talk about the United States color troops. I can remember marching in several parades. Now, many of those times there were as many as 10 different USCT units. All of us had our own flag, some of us had two flags. But the crowds everywhere we went kept yelling, give them hell 54th. So I know they must have seen the movie Glory. But I think that many people think that that was the only black regiment in the entire Civil War. Now, they were authorized in 1863 by Governor John Andrew, and they were going to be the first U.S. colored troops raised in the Old North. Colonel Robert Gould Shaw is going to be their commander. Shaw's parents were very influential in Massachusetts, and they were abolitionists, as was Shaw and most of the officers. The soldiers were recruited by abolitionists, black abolitionists all across the country, including Frederick Douglass, who is perhaps the greatest African American in the 19th century. He sent two of his sons to the 54th, and they trained at Camp Miggs in Massachusetts and Reedville, and they were mustered in the service May 28, 1863. Most of the men, the overwhelming majority of the men, were educated men, and very few slaves were in that regiment. Therefore, the movie was not a fair representation of the actual regiment. They're most famous for spearheading the attack on Fort Wagner on July 18, 1863. The 54th and some white units that were with them took the outer walls of the fort, but they could not take the fort. Colonel Shaw and 271 of his men were casualties, and Shaw was famously buried with his black troops. However, the 54th, 55th Massachusetts, and some white units actually were victorious at the abandonment of Fort Wagner after a long siege, which ended on September 7th, 1863. The soldiers depicted in glory were more like the average USCT unit, like the 23rd. They're going to be mostly a mixture of enslaved men, some freedmen, and some men who were already free. In the movie Lincoln, one of the first scenes you'll see, it shows Lincoln talking with two USCT soldiers. One was an older gentleman, who was a former slave, and he talked about the Battle of Jenkins Ferry on April 30th, 1864. He talked about how they made sure that there were no Confederates left alive. And that's because they were retaliating for the atrocities of the Confederates when they murdered the prisoners taken at Poison Spring and Mark's Mill. In few battles, you do have USCT retaliating for those atrocities and you'll have Confederates doing the same thing. That's part of the Civil War history that's rarely discussed. I can remember all through school they're telling me that the United States Civil War was a civil war. You didn't have as much violence and atrocities as you would see in other wars. And since I've become a historian, I can tell you that's not true. There's always a lot of violence in war. The next black soldier that he talked to was a member of the 5th Massachusetts Cavalry. That man was very educated. And he was like most of the men in the 54th Mass, the 55th Mass, and the 5th Mass Cavalry. And that's because when the 54th was recruited, there was such an overflow of recruits that some of those men went into the 55th Mass and the 5th Mass Cavalry. But I'm here today to talk about all of the United States Colored Troops, who were also known as the United States Colored Troops. Some would be United States Colored Infantry, and you had other areas of the Army. But at the beginning of the Civil War, most men were not, most black men were not allowed to join either Army. And some people may ask, well, why would they think about joining the Confederate Army? Well, they thought, thought if they fought for the Confederacy, they would be free. So 
you had a lot of men trying to get in both armies. But by the end of the war, you had some 180,000 to 200,000 blacks that served in the United States Army and about another 20 to 29,000 blacks that served in the United States Navy. Now this slide is gonna show the numbers of USCT that are in the mo monument and memorial that they have at the African American Civil War Memorial and Museum in Washington, D.C. And today that is where all of the black reenactor units are based out of. We can always call that our home. Now the numbers have been changing since uh, historians have been looking at the 1860 and 1870 census, but all of the numbers on the wall that are etched in the memorial were researched at the National Archives. And it shows that there were 209,145 members of the USCT, 201,000 blacks, 7,000 white officers, and 1,145 Hispanics. Now the numbers may be skewed a little bit because some soldiers that were in USCT units may have transferred to others. And that's gonna be a person like Charles Douglas, the son of Frederick Douglass. He was in the 54th Mass originally, and then he is going to transfer to the 5th Massachusetts Cavalry. But Douglass, inspired many of the soldiers in this famous recruiting speech. And I quote, the opportunity is given us to be men. With one courageous resolution, we may blot out the handwriting of ages against us. Once let the black man get upon his person the brass letters US. Let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket, and there is no power on the earth or under the earth which can deny that he has earned the right of citizenship in the United States. I say again, this is our chance, and woe betide us if we fail to embrace it. Now, during the Civil War, there were only four state regiments that will retain their state identification. All of the other state regiments will be changed to USCT regiments. But those four are probably pretty famous, and that's the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Colored, the 55th Massachusetts Infantry Colored, the 5th Massachusetts Cavalry Colored, and the 29th Connecticut Infantry Colored. They were all part of the USCT, but they maintained their state designations. The actual order creating the Bureau of Color Troops was General Order Number 143. It was issued May 22, 1863. And by the end of the war, there were 166 regiments of infantry, cavalry, heavy artillery, engineers, and light artillery. Approximately 38,000 to 43,000 died and another 30,000 were injured. But most deaths were caused by disease, though many were executed on many of the battlefields where they thought, fought. Now, this is a very famous painting and it has a lot of controversy surrounding it. But this painting was actually used on recruiting posters for USCT. Of course, they had words around it and various recruiting posters, but that picture was very famous. Now, those soldiers were actually from Fort William, uh, Camp William Penn in Philadelphia, and they could be the 3rd Regiment USCT, but we're not sure. But they were the 3rd the USCT was the first to leave Camp William Penn and going into the war. Now, Frederick Douglass gave them an inspirational speech before they left, and I'll talk about that a little later. Now, for example, some of the state units that changed was, for example, the 1st North Carolina Colored Infantry. They became the 35th USCT. 
the USET fought in approximately 450 battle actions, and they were instrumental in helping to win the Civil War and freedom for their people. As a result of their contributions during the war, three amendments were added to the Constitution. The 13th that abolished slavery, the 14th that gave equal rights to blacks, and the 15th that gave the right to vote to the black men. Now remember, back at that time, no woman, white or black, was allowed to vote. The first black troops in the war were actually enlisted in 1862. They were raised in South Carolina, Kansas, and Louisiana. And that's because on July 17, 1862, the second confiscation and militia acts were approved and subsequently signed by President Lincoln. These acts allowed as many persons of African descent as necessary to be employed to help suppress the rebellion and use them in such manner as he may judge best for public welfare. To some, this meant that they could be soldiers. In South Carolina, General David Hunter had organized a regiment of South Carolina former slaves, the 1st South Carolina Colored Infantry, only to have them disbanded because President Lincoln would not approve Hunter's emancipation of slaves in his military district, nor authorize the raising of black troops. While Hunter failed, orders were addressed to General Rufus Saxton on August 25, 1862, to raise 5,000 black soldiers. The 1st South Carolina Colored Infantry was reformed, and they later became the 33rd USCT. The importance of this order was that these soldiers were raised by the authority of the United States War Department and not by some enterprising general on his own authority. In Kansas, a paragraph in the newspaper, The Daily Conservative, of October 6, 1861, described Senator James H. Lane's cavalrymen as such, and I quote, one peculiarity of this mounted force is curious enough to be noted down. By the side of one dowdy and white cavalier rode an erect, well-armed, and very black man. His figure and bearing were such that without any other distinguishing characteristic, he would still have been a marked man. But this is the first instance which has come to our personal knowledge, although not the only one, in fact, of a contraband serving as a Union soldier. And this was in the fall of 1861, and Kansas had some black soldiers. But they had come through the fighting during the Kansas and Nebraska Act of 1854, and that fighting went on all the way up and through the Civil War. Officially now, General Lane organized the first Kansas Colored Infantry on August 5, 1862, with his notification to the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. But the next day, he wired Stanton again and stated that he was raising these soldiers based on the Second Confiscation Act. So in the first Kansas, has the distinction of being the first colored troops to engage the enemy in October 1862 with a raiding party in Missouri and the skirmish at Island Mound. They later became the 79th USCT. In Louisiana in 1862, General John Phelps began to recruit the blacks, the Louisiana Native Guard to reinforce his troops outside of New Orleans. General Benjamin Butler could not authorize General Phelps to do so, so Phelps resigned. Now, when you look at this picture, it says that this first picture on, on the left side is the first Louisiana Native Guard in 1861. And then you look at the other picture on the other side, and that's the actual photo from US Camp William Penn. And the painting, that I shared earlier, those were the soldiers. Now, the members of the Guard actually approached Butler first because Butler could not get any reinforcements that he wanted from the U.S. government. 
So he is going to authorize three regiments of Louisiana Native Guard. The first and second Native Guard are going to have their own black officers. The third regiment will have black and white officers. General Butler changed their name from the Louisiana Native Guard to the Corps d'Afrique. And later in the war, their designations will be changed to USCTs. They became the 73rd, 74th, and 75th USCT. But again, going back to this picture, now I went to one roundtable meeting and a man was talking about his book. And he showed that picture, the first Louisiana Native Guard, 1861. And I tried to warn him before that that was not a picture of the Louisiana Native Guard. But he used as, or he cited the internet as saying that these were the Native Guard. So I showed them this other picture, and I said, look at each one of those soldiers. They are the exact same soldiers. I said, you go to Independence Hall in Philadelphia, and you'll see the painting and the picture of those soldiers. They came from Camp William Penn. So you can't believe everything you read on the internet, but you have to actually do the research. Because many years ago when I saw that picture, I actually thought it was a Louisiana Native Guard until I saw the original picture, and I said, these men all look the same. And then I compared each one, and that's how I found out about it. Plus, if you look at those pictures, they're wearing Union greatcoats. And he, this guy had said, who thought they were the Native Guard, that those were Confederate uniforms. So they're not. As I said earlier, the Louisiana Native Guard were militia for the state of Louisiana. They were not Confederate soldiers. Louisiana, which has black militia dating all the way back to 1727. Louisiana was a French territory, then they ceded it to Spain for a while, and then the French got it back before it was bought by the United States. So many of those men were French or Spanish or Creole. And a lot of them were wealthy black entrepreneurs who were educated in Europe. In fact, it is said that the members, the wealthy members or African American members of the Louisiana Native Guard had more wealth than all of the blacks in New York City. So they were very wealthy guys. And they had property to protect in Louisiana. Now let's take a step back. Now when I talk about this subject, I always talk about when the soldiers were actually founded. However, at the beginning of the war, black men had tried to get in both armies. And that's going to happen after the Battle of Fort Sumter. On April 15th, President Abraham Lincoln calls for 75,000 militia to put down the rebellion. When Pennsylvania sent its troops to Washington, they marched through Baltimore on April 18th, where a mob met them, and the first man wounded was a black man named Nicholas Biddle. While there were a few black men in state militias, most states north and south banned blacks. However, there were some that did get into militias. Knowing that a state of war existed in the United States, blacks were denied by both governments. However, on May 2nd, 1861, the state of Louisiana accepted the Louisiana Native Guard. Now, both armies used thousands of black servants, teamsters, cooks, scouts, and other support duties. These type of duties did not qualify for being soldiers back in the Civil War. However, there are stories that some of these men may have picked up weapons and fought the enemy. And that's probably true. I've seen many accounts where men have done that. But blacks were not allowed in the Confederate Army until March of 1865. And some of those blacks had served in other duties for the Confederacy. 
such as hospital stewards in Chimborazo. They served at a hospital in Richmond, which was a very famous hospital and now part of the Richmond battlefields. There were about 50 blacks that were in the integrated companies that left at the fall of Richmond, which happens in April of 1865. Now this one black man on this slide we are very proud of because he's Sergeant Nimrod Burke of the 23rd United States Color Troops. Now Nimrod, at the beginning of the war, was a scout and a teamster for the 36th Ohio Infantry. And he served there from April 1861 until he joined the 23rd in 1864. Now he is from Prince William County, Virginia, but his family was freed a long time, so he moved to Ohio. So he served as a free man, as a teamster and a scout. While black men were not allowed in the Union and Confederate armies, there were some light-skinned blacks who actually passed for whites that were in both armies. And we'll never know the full extent of how many did that. But one example was Lieutenant Colonel William N. Reed of the 1st North Carolina Colored Cavalry, uh, excuse me, Colored Infantry, later designated the 35th USCT. In some places he was listed as white, other places he was listed as a mulatto. But his father was a white Danish man and his mother was a black slave from St. Croix, Virgin Islands. Reed was an abolitionist from New York, but he graduated from military school in Kiel, Denmark. And most people think of that as being Germany and it does become part of Germany after the Second Prussian War. And he served in the Danish army before coming back to the States. He would lead the first North Carolina at the Battle of Alusty. He was taking over for the Colonel who was not there. He was mortally wounded in action and died, but he was in command and he talked about the discipline of the 35th USCT when the 35th and the 54th Massachusetts actually held the line as the Union troops were retreating. But Lieutenant Colonel William N. Reed is recognized as the highest ranking African American officer in the Civil War. And his muster papers are right under his name. But the other guy, you see his picture, Colonel John Wells Jefferson. Actually last year, well yeah, last year I went to Monticello and I saw pictures of African Americans with ties to Monticello who actually served with the Union Army in the Civil War. One picture was Colonel John Wells Jefferson, who was originally John Wells Hemings. He is the grandson of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. His father was Eston Hemings, who moved his family from Virginia to Ohio. And in 1852, because of the Fugitive Slave Act, they had to get out of Ohio. So they go to Wisconsin, and the father changes the family name to Jefferson. And he let people know that he is the son of Thomas Jefferson. So they passed as white in Wisconsin, and John enlisted in the 8th Wisconsin Volunteer Infantry as a major. He fought at different battles, Vicksburg probably being the most famous. He was promoted to lieutenant colonel and colonel. And he commanded that regiment until the end of the war. The African American has his biography at Monticello and on the American Battlefield Trust website. He is known in both places as an African American and hopefully he will soon be listed as the highest ranking African American officer in the Civil War. But another black man used ingenuity to enter the army. William Henry Johnson joined the second Connecticut and registered as a quote unquote independent man, a status that was not clearly identified. After his 90 day term expired with the second Connecticut, he enlisted in the eighth Connecticut and fought at first bull run and during Burnside's North Carolina expedition 
to Roanoke Island and New Bern. Although Johnson could not pass as white, there were some soldiers in both armies that did pass. Now, the black soldiers all were involved in the pay controversy where white troops were paid $13 a month plus a $3 clothing allowance, where black troops were paid only $10 a month with a $3 clothing fee withheld, making their pay $7 a month. And that's less than half of what the white soldiers made. But blacks were paid in accordance with the Second Confiscation and Militia Acts, even though they were now recognized as regular soldiers. Now, on September 28, 1864, pay was equalized by Congress, and they received 18 months' pay from the time that they were in, or depending on the time of their enlistment. But only the free black soldiers got paid the back pay. Those slaves who had joined the Army, they were not eligible for the back pay. This controversy was part of the movie Glory when you saw Denzel Washington tearing up the pay stubs. Now let me discuss a few of the battles. We, we know the Battle of Fort Wagner where the 54th Massachusetts made his grand assault and Sergeant William H. Carney earned the Medal of Honor at that battle. But the Battle of Wilson's Landing or Wilson's Wharf. Now two years ago I did participate in the reenactment that they have at Fort Pocahontas in Charles City, Virginia. Every year they celebrate or commemorate the Battle of Wilson's Wharf or Wilson's Landing. Happened May 24th, 1864 in Virginia, and it pitted 900 men of the 1st and the 10th U.S. colored troops plus 150 white soldiers from a transport and two cannons from the Battery M of the 3rd New York Light Artillery, and they were under General Edward Wilde. Now, Wilde is um, the commander of what they call Wilde's, Brigade, Wilde's African Brigade. Wilde was a very colorful abolitionist and general in the Civil War. They were commanding, this is about 1,100 or so men, against 2,500 Confederate cavalry commanded by General Fitzhugh Lee. He was the nephew of General Robert E. Lee. And after Lee drove in the pickets, he sent a flag of truce in demanding the surrender of the garrison. But General Wilde declined and said, quote, unquote, we will try it. And then he added, and I quote, present my compliments to General Fitz Lee and tell him to go to hell, unquote. A transport landed 150 unarmed white soldiers and the gunboat USS Don helped the Union forces. General Lee ordered a charge that was beaten back by the black and white soldiers there. Union casualties were about ranging from 25 to 47 and Confederate casualties ranged from 175 to 200. This was the first real battle of the USCT and the Army of Northern Virginia. The Battle of Newmarket Heights was fought on September 29, 1864, with troops of the Army of the James attacking fortifications defending the Confederate capital of Richmond. General Charles Payne's 3rd Division of the 18th Corps was three brigades of black troops and General William Burney had a colored brigade in the 10th Corps. The black troops faced a galling fire but succeeded in capturing Newmarket Heights. 14 black soldiers earned the Medal of Honor for their actions at Newmarket Heights. The first attacks on Petersburg, June 15 to 17, 1864, involved black troops from the Army of the James, who captured some of the defensive works outside the city. The USCT fought ferociously with the battle cry, remember Fort Pillow. That day, black soldiers took no prisoners, executing wounded and surrendering Confederates until their white officers got tired of seeing so much bloodshed. However, on July 30, 1864, at the Battle of the Crater in Petersburg, 
the black troops of the Ninth Corps, the Army of the Potomac, who were trained to lead the attack, were made to be the last attacking division. And by that time, there was a strong Confederate counterattack. And when the Confederates saw the black troops, they were enraged and took few black prisoners. They yelled no quarter and executed black soldiers who were wounded or surrendered on the field. Confederates said they would kill white soldiers, aiding black soldiers. This was a debacle. And in many battles after Fort Pillow, black so soldiers offered no quarter to white soldiers, and Confederate soldiers did the same to them. But the Confederate soldiers did it on many more occasions than the black soldiers did. The Battle of Nashville, eight regiments of black troops, two brigades were supposed to make a demonstration on the Confederate right wing so that General George Henry Thomas could attack the left wing. Their attack was so strong that the Confederates weakened the left wing. The black troops faced heavy fire from Confederate batteries and suffered tremendous casualties. But George Henry Thomas was able to destroy General John Bell Hood's Confederate Army because that left flank was weakened so much by the black troops attacking in, on the right. In December of 1864, the black division of the Ninth Corps in the Army of the Potomac and the two black divisions of the 10th and 18th Corps, the Army of the James, formed the 25th Corps in the Army of the James. This became the largest grouping of black soldiers in the entire Civil War. General Benjamin Butler, commander of the Army of the James, loved having black troops in his corps. In fact, um, he tried to get the black 9th Corps division transferred to him before the Battle of the Crater, but that didn't take place. Now, in the greater Fredericksburg area, the first black troops to fight General Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia was the 23rd Regiment United States Colored Troops. My colleagues and I represent the 23rd during the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse on May 15, 1864, they were called on to assist the 2nd Ohio Cavalry who were being chased by General Thomas Rosser's Brigade of Cavalry. They marched from the Chancellorsville ruins to the intersection of what was then Catharpin and Orange Plank Road to the Allrich Farm and they drove back the Confederate Cavalry. That let the white soldiers know that the black soldiers would fight. And this was very specific to that area because many of the soldiers in the 23rd were escaped slaves from the Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania County area. And they were now fighting on their own home ground. But let me start with the story of the 23rd. As you see right here, the 23rd has an exhibit at the Chancellorsville Battlefield Visitor Center. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. But let's talk about how the black troops in the 4th Division of the 9th Corps came to being. In January 1864, General Ambrose Burnside was asked to reconstitute the 9th Corps. And he told General uh, Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of Defense, that he would if he could have a black division. And Stanton agreed, and the 4th Division of the 9th Corps was now going to be formed. Now, this is going to be pretty, pretty confusing for General Grant because General Ambrose Burnside outranked General George Gordon Meade. So he could not report to him. So the 9th Corps was going to operate as an independent Army Corps together with the Army of the Potomac in General Grant's overland campaign. That created such confusion that every time that General Grant had to get or give orders for both armies to work together, he had to do that. And it's going to change. By May 24th, he had enough of that, and he's going to place the 9th Corps under the Army of the Potomac. Now, the 4th Division was two brigades. The regiments were divided 
And the first one is going to be made up of the 27th, 30th, and 39th, and 43rd USCT. Second Brigade, at first was the 30th Connecticut Colored Infantry. They only had about four companies, so they were transferred to the 31st USCT. And then the 19th, the 23rd, the 31st USCT. And in late June, the 28th and 29th USCT were added to that 2nd Brigade. These regiments came from all across the north, from Illinois to Connecticut, and east from New York to Virginia. There were stories about when all of these soldiers got together in Petersburg that some members saw their old family members. And for some soldiers, it was sort of a homecoming. Now, the men of the 23rd were recruited in the Washington, D.C. area, and many of those men had come from the Fredericksburg area. In April of 1862 to August of 1862, over 10,000 slaves will escape from the Fredericksburg area, many of them following the Union Army back to the Washington, D.C. area. So they were organized and trained at Camp Casey, Virginia. Camp Casey is approximately where the Pentagon is today. So many of those men were free and ex-slaves from Virginia. The Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park's Mysteries and Conundrums blog has published the stories of three members of the 23rd, Andrew Weaver, Peter Churchwell, and Abraham Tux. Now, I will read the official reports from the official records about the skirmish on the 15th of May. Headquarters Division, 9th Army Corps. Miller's House on Plank Road, east of Alridge's, May 15th, 1864. General, I have the honor to report that at 12.30 p.m. the day, the 2nd Ohio Cavalry, stationed at Piney Branch Church, were compelled to fall back, being attacked by superior forces, consisting of one brigade of cavalry with two pieces of artillery. I immediately ordered the 4th Division in readiness and marched the 23rd U.S. Colored Troops to support the cavalry. On arriving at Alridge's on Plank Road, I found the 2nd Ohio driven across the road and the enemy occupying the crossroads. I ordered the colored regiment to advance on the enemy in line of battle, which they did and drove the enemy in perfect route. Not being able to pursue with infantry, the 2nd Ohio formed and gave chase to Piney Branch Church, which they, the 2nd Ohio, now occupy. All quiet elsewhere. Our loss amounted to eight or 10 wounded. The enemy lost some five horses killed. I have changed my position to a more secure one to protect the trains and roads leading to the army. I have since learned from one of my scouts that Hampton's brigade is in full retreat in perfect disorder toward Todd's Tavern. I am General, very respectfully your obedient servant, Edward Ferrero, Brigadier General Commanding, sent to Brigadier General Rawlins, Chief of Staff. On May 19th, the entire 4th Division of the 9th Corps will fight again against Thomas Rosser's probing cavalry. Now, after the war, well, the 23rd was at the Battle of the Crater, where they suffered the most losses of any of the USCT regiments, and they finished the war in the Appomattox Campaign. After the war, they stay in Virginia, and later, they're going to be sent to Texas. The entire 25th Corps is going to go to Texas as a part of General Sheridan's 50,000-man army. France had taken over Mexico and were thinking of invading Texas. But the power of the American army led to the overthrow of the French from Mexico. Some of those black soldiers stayed out west and became Buffalo soldiers. Now, in the fall of 2010, I was working at Spotsylvania Courthouse Battlefield for the National Park Service. I was at the bloody angle with my friend and fellow historian John Cummings. We discussed the upcoming 150th anniversary of the 23rd USCT, and we thought about forming it then. January 2011, we formed the unit with five original members, which grew to about 25 at its height. I was the first president, and since 2011, we have participated in over 200 events including our first in-person event since 2000, uh, from 2020, 
We um, just participated on March 13th with the American Legion of Fredericksburg. They had a History for Kids program. So four of us came down dressed in our uniforms. We love to be in a uniform, especially when there is a chance to educate people about the United States Color Troops. So on May 17th, the 23rd, with other USCT and Union Living Histor History regiments and reenactors, along with the assistance of the Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania community, celebrated the 150th anniversary of their first skirmish. The Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park had the grand reopening of the ch recently renovated Chancellorsville Battlefield Visitor Center. And the Visitor Center now has a lot more exhibits about African Americans than it did before. Before it was renovated, they had the same exhibits for over 50 years. And 2014 is when it changed. So when they opened it up, we had the exhibit. And many other people took pictures of the 23rd at the Visitor Center next to that picture. Now, that picture is of Sergeant George Washington. And he was from Spotsylvania County. However, he was one of 12 George Washingtons in the 23rd. And that's because a lot of the slaves didn't have official names or only had one name. Or, since they were from that area, if any of the slave owners found out that they were serving in the Union Army, their relatives still in captivity could suffer harsh punishment. So they changed their names to George Washingtons. And one day, after we started the 23rd, I just happened to look in the roster written down, and there were so many George Washingtons that took pages in the roster. Also on that day, we had a big program, and the Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park sponsored a lot of it. Uh, we did have a big program on the Chancellorsville Battlefield, the Fairview section, and Voice of America was there. They interviewed many of the participants, and they actually did a short video and put it on their website. But we had the Sons of Union Veterans, General U.S. Grant, the same General Grant that we had at Appomattox. Uh, Larry Clowers portrayed him. And we had multiple Union regiments there. John Hennessy was the chief historian of uh, Spotsylvania, Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park, and he was the keynote speaker at that part of the ceremony. And then we had another ceremony right at the site of the skirmish. The old Allrich Farm is now the Heflin Farm. The Heflin family allowed us to set up a tent and have people there. We had a procession from the Chancellorsville Battlefield, led by all of the Union reenactors first, and then the community actually followed us, and the community was able to sit under the tent, and we had the ceremony, and that was for the unveiling of the Virginia State Marker, the 23rd USCT at the Allrich Farm. That was about a half mile away from where we were at the Heflin Farm. So that shows one of the tents that we had. But you see all of the different reenactors that were behind me. I was um, the MC for the program. And standing next to me on my left was uh, Lou Carter. And to his left was John Cummings. Lou Carter at that time was the president of the 54th Massachusetts Company B. And John Cummings was the co-founder of the 23rd with me. But that didn't end the day because when we were there, we had two keynote speakers there, Dr. James Bryant and General U.S. Grant Larry Clowers. So they gave the keynote speakers there, uh, speeches there. After that, we did have a big reception at the John J. Wright Museum. So hopefully we gave a good recognition to those soldiers from the 23rd. Frederick Douglass, likely on July 24, 1863, spoke to the 3rd USCT about their importance in the Civil War as some of America's first black federal troops. And he probably gave this speech to more regiments as well. 
The fortunes of the whole race for generations to come are bound up in the success or failure of the 3rd Regiment of Colored Troops from the North. You are a spectacle for men and angels. You are in a manner to answer the question, can the black man be a soldier? That we can now make soldiers of these men, there can be no doubt. Douglas's powerful words resonated with many of the soldiers who like him were ex-slaves. But in conclusion, black soldiers fought in numerous battle actions, approximately 450. And in those battles, they suffered an enormous amount of casualties, depending on how well they were trained. Some fought very well, some were average, and some fought poorly, just like white troops. However, many of the soldiers who fought alongside of them talk about their discipline, bravery, and their willingness to keep fighting while suffering so many casualties. By the war's end, they make up 10% of the Union Army. And they enlisted at a time when there was a big slowdown in white enlistment. Many historians state that their efforts went a long way to winning the war. General Benjamin Butler, who was not the greatest general, but he did appreciate black troops. He created the Army of the James Medal, commonly called the Butler Medal. It was the only medal ever struck, <clears throat> excuse me, struck for colored troops. Butler designed and paid for these medals after the battle of Chaffin's Farm or New Market Heights. And I close with this quote from General Butler, who appeared before Congress after the war, advocating the passage of a bill for giving civil rights to Negro, the Negro race. He gave an eyewitness account of the fighting at New Market Heights and then said of the dead, and I quote, I looked on their bronze faces, upturned in the shining sun, as if in mute appeal against the wrongs of the country for which they had given their lives and whose flag had only been to them a flag of stripes on which no star of glory had ever shone for them. Feeling I had wronged them in the past and believing what was the future of my country to them, among my dead comrades there I swore to myself a solemn oath. May my right hand forget its cunning and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I ever fail to defend the rights of those men who have given their blood for me and my country, this day and for their race forever, and God helping me, I will keep that oath. Thank you.